Good morning, church. How are y'all doing? <clears throat> so the, all that I would ask for this morning is a little bit of grace. I was up to 1 a.m. prepping for this morning, but it's God's word, amen, and it's going to shape us. So this is my first time preaching in a long time, actually, before my sabbatical, and uh, I want to say maybe August 2020 or so. I, it's been a blur. How much of this last two years has been kind of a blur for you, too? You kind of don't know what month you're in, and the world is crazy. Um, it may have been right after we returned um, in person together, which if you say that out loud, sounds a little crazy. Um, it's like, when did you gather for church? Well, streaming online, you know? Um, but it was. It was, no matter really where you stood personally on the whole government restrictions piece, we can all admit it was weird. It was strange. Confusing, apocalyptic at moments. Dystopian, right? No one on the streets. You just see a tumbleweed going. You're like, I've seen movies about this. What's, what's going on? And I can tell you, as a pastor, we also didn't know what to do. We didn't. And uh, it, it was hard to navigate. It was hard to navigate that. What's right? What's wrong? Separation church of state stuff. You know, do we, what do we do? It was definitely tough. And I know over the last year, um, six months or so, you, you've heard from the other pastor's hearts about how the last two years was to our church and how it affected us and what it, it, what it did. And it, it definitely wasn't easy. I know, I know Pastor Tim has walked through some seasons and Pastor Clint explained some of this during um, the business meeting. But it's definitely a feeling we never have felt before. And this morning is my chance as your third pastor to share with you my heart my heart about how this last two years has been. There were definitely plenty of wins, um, you know, during that time, things that were surprising, and I'm going I'm to share a little bit of that today. But there were also some swings and misses on, on our leadership. One of the biggest breakdowns I can say in our church, most definitely, and you've heard this over and over as a refrain, was really some of our small groups, um, going away, Awana going away for a time, youth not meeting in person for a time. Um, and they were strong. I mean, right, right before the pandemic, they, they were really strong, and then they, they broke apart. And that feeling of disfellowship rang through our church in several other areas. There were some small groups that did remain together, did keep plowing through. Uh, mine was one that I was leading that, that we had stopped meeting, Ours had other circumstances with Brittany's father passing um, that made it hard, you know, made it hard to host. And it just piles up, right? Just one thing after another. And how many of y'all felt that during the last two years? Just one thing after another. And, and you just don't know what to do anymore. And you don't know how to react because it's all so new. But for the longest time, our home groups have handled most of the pastoral care. Um, and that pastoral care had gone away and essentially had landed mainly in Pastor Tim's lap through a lot of counseling. Could you guys turn this down just a hair? It's ringing just a little bit up here, if you don't mind, Taylor. Just, just a couple decibels. Um, but I'm most certain that the other pastors would sympathize that some of you did feel alone and not heard. I can say that for myself, and I'm, I'm deeply sorry. I was speaking with a member on the phone this last week, and, and, and it broke my heart. Um, did did you all turn that down just a little bit? If we can turn it just a couple more decibels. It's ringing up here just a little bit. Um, I was speaking with a member on the phone this week, and they were explaining to me how alone they've been. And in their heart and mind, they are still a member of Grace Hill Church. And they said, leadership never reached out to me. That crushes me. It crushes us. I know that I can speak for myself, but I'm sure Pastor Clint would reiterate the same thing. 
I'm sorry you didn't feel heard, known, or seen. If you know someone struggling that they haven't been back, let me know, and we'll, do an, we'll have an effort to reach out to them the best that we can and reach out and try to, try to create some healing there. I would call this a wound of omission. An omission wound is one that wasn't intended, but either way it happened, and it was felt, and that's not okay. Yet in our prayer meeting last month, I feel the beginning of something different at Grace Hill. It started with repentance. It started with reading of the word. It started with praying together. It started with coming together. And really, because it's, it's not this tiered thing like you have your pastors up here and the members down here. We're all on the same level playing field. And we all had to come to the table and say, we're going to make some changes with the launch of a new home group that's starting today um, here at the church, um, a few new Bible studies, a potluck of all things, <laughs> mystery meat, yep, those things seem to work and they, they help, they bring some type of love. Well, there's something about sharing a meal, right, when you come together as a, as a church and you do wonder what you put in your mouth sometimes, but you know it's okay, <laughs> it's going to be all right. <laughs> Keep bringing food. That's not a diss on anyone. All the food was amazing last time. Okay? Um, but I can tell you, e- even after all that and looking back, and, and one may not always see this. It's definitely not an accusation. But there's also loneliness in the pastor's home, too. And something we had all come together as the pastors, and we said, hey, I'm lonely, too. Everyone is, so we need to do something about it. But that those feelings, those same subcultures that develop in the church are also felt in the pastor's home. We feel it. And sometimes I think about if, if you've ever looked back um, at this season, we really haven't had a chance to grieve what we've lost over the last two years. And I would encourage you as a family to maybe make time for that. The last two years for our country and for us as a church um, definitely was something we all need to learn from and draw close to Christ on. I hope you, you, you know that this matters. Us gathering matters. And there's nothing that can replace that. A camera can't replace that. A Zoom meeting can't replace this. There's just nothing like this. But although the last two years have been hard, there were moments of grace that deeply affected me, affected my family. There were two phone calls in particular that I can, that I had received that I want to share with you from two close friends that changed the way I felt about brotherly love. So the day after my friend, father-in-law, Paul Edney, passed last year, a dear friend left me a voicemail and it's still on my phone and he expressed to me, wow, Paul, meant a lot to him, inspired him as an artist, as a musician. And that Paul's coming to Christ, his salvation story, inspired him and changed his life. That meant a lot. You know, when someone's hurting, just leave a voicemail. It's okay. They'll listen. And it affects them. It affected me. The other call was one I made. Paul was a painter, and so he had some labor that, that he gets prepaid for. And I had called a friend um, to just figure out some of his financial affairs, work out a payment plan to repay that debt. And the friend said, Psh, keep it. It's the least I can do. That was a grace we felt. Those kinds of graces you never forget, do you? It's those moments where someone gives you something freely, without anything back. And it changes the way you feel. For me, it helped me understand brotherly love in a way I never did before. That at the end of the day, the brothers and sisters in Christ, and both of those friends are from this church, praise God, and they executed love. And what does love do? It changes you. It should change us, right? It should affect change in us. So I received a grace. I'm sure you can recall graces you've received as well over the time of your life, 
over where you look back and maybe it was an unknown. You know those moments where you look back and say, wow, they did that without me even knowing and they still did it. You can think about all those moments as a child when your parents or your grandparents or a guardian in your life went the extra mile for you and, and you didn't even know they did. Why would anyone do that for me? Why would anyone consider me? I didn't do anything to deserve that kind of love. Think of that memory. Think of that person. Think of that moment in your life that affected you. And a million times over, the God of heaven has, pres- has proposed to you and me this idea of radical love in a way that we still don't see its fullness. He has proposed this kind of love that transforms us, that gives us faith. He's, re- he's revealing himself to you. So this text that we're going to read this morning, if you would stand with me, we're going to read the God's word this morning out of Genesis chapter 15, verse 1 through 18. So a little sidestep from 1 Peter. <laughs> so this, this text has been on my heart, so we're going to go with that, all right? Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 through 18. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me for I continue childless? And the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted to him his righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down, On the carcasses, Adam drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, dreadful, a great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be your sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for four hundred years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. And as for you... You shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down, it was dark. Behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. Dear Lord, we thank you today. We thank you for your mercies, grace, power, love. I pray that today we would see that you give faith. You give faith to those that you love, those that you'll preserve. Help us to see you as you are, great, mighty, faithful, trustworthy. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. So today... Uh, My subject is faith in Christ is the only way to know God's love. Faith in Christ is the only way to know God's love. My purpose today is for us to live out our faith by completely trusting in God for the results of our futures. For us to live out our faith by completely trusting in God for the results of our future. 
So since we haven't been in the book of Genesis, essentially book of Genesis, um, we've, so before this, I have preached through this, this book before, and before this time, before the scripture that we read, um, God has had interactions with Abram. He, he called him, and Abram understood the calling, and he followed. There's actually very few and far between connections and conversations between Abram and Yahweh. We may look at that and go, wow, Abram really had this strong connection with God all the time. Um, that's not the case. A- Abram stumbled along the way as he was drawing close to God. Abraham was from a different land and people, a very pluralistic region where God was not known, Yahweh was not known, but called him out of that. Abram followed him. Simple following, a beautiful faith in action. In verse 1, it says, after these things, refers to all of these moments that Abram had had after he was called. Um, The first part of Genesis really is what they call prehistory. It's this this time and space that we we don't know exactly the length of time between um, chapter 11 um, and chapter 12, where chapter 12 we learn of Abram. So there's a span of time we're, we're not so sure of. And it really just starts with God calling Abram out from his land of Ur and Abram following after God. But you can easily mock up Abram's life in just a few short sentences. And I want to read these to you. I put them up here for you guys to see some of these faith moments that Abram had so we can get the context of his life. This is pretty much God's conversation with Abram. I'm going to send you out. And then Abram says, when? And then God says, I'll tell you later. I will give you land. Then Abram says, where? Then God said, I'll tell you later. (laughs) I will give you a child. Abram says, how? Then God says, I'll tell you later. Give up your child. Then Abram says, why? Then God says, I'll tell you later. It's essentially Abram's story of faith walking through the season of the unknown, really walking in faith. Really walking in faith. These are the junctions with Abram and his humanity dealing with these, but actually responding with true faith. Verses one later, it says, The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. And here we're getting the context of the story that the word of the Lord is faithful. So what does God say? I am your shield. God is reassuring him that nothing will stand between God's plan and him. But after this reassurance of protection and reward, Abram has the most interesting question, a very real one. It's not disrespectful tone, but one of a sincere question. Abram said, O Lord God, What will you give me for I continue childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring. And a member of my household will be my heir. He wants nothing more than a child. And now we're starting to see this conversation unfold like a kid and his father. And behold, in verse 4, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, look toward heaven, number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And here's the key word here. And he believed the Lord. And he counted to him as righteousness. Genesis 15, 6 is a hinge verse for how man and God should communicate with each other. This sentence in the ESV uses a very pointed way of interpretation of the original Hebrew. It says that Abram believed the Lord. The fact that Abram believed the Lord is the fact that he believed his word. He believed in the person of God. He didn't just believe in the idea of God. He believed in God, personally God. He had faith. And that's what makes Christianity different than all the religions. We trust and have faith in a real living being. We trust in him. We don't just trust in this ether karma space out there that it's intangible. 
We trust in a living God. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, it says, Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. In Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, it echoes this. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham? Our forefather according to the flesh... For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. In James chapter 2, verse 21, it says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac to the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And those are works as in good works fueled by faith, not works fueled by death, which is we're born into sin, and any work that is trying to attain salvation is just good work, not good works that is fueled by faith, just so that we have clarity there. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. So this is bigger than mental acknowledgement. This is friendship. This is faith. This is love. And that type of intimacy, that closeness that Abraham had with God is the same intimacy and closeness that God wants of us. That's the desire of his heart, that we draw close to him through faith in Christ. We get to enter close in his presence and listen to him. We get to talk to God. We have a one-way communication to the Lord. Jesus is our mediator, the perfect one. We get to speak directly to God. Even before the fall, there have always been two choices, a tree of faith and a tree of understanding good and evil, knowing the risk that that God is, is keeping us from, temptation is keeping us from, Really, the idea of the two trees is one that God is asking us to believe in him because he knows his purposes are good. He knows that the future that you don't see, if you follow in his pathway, leads to wholeness, not only salvation, but clarity and beauty and blessing for your family, for your marriage, for your friendships. See, sin messed it all up. Sin just brought chaos to the order that God provided in faith. But there's that other tree, the tree of of not trusting in God for our futures, not trusting in God that he knows what's best, but taking it for our own. Believing in yourself rather than God only brings destruction. See, Abram has eaten from the tree of faith, You see, only God does the work, and Abraham responds to that work. It was God who called Abram out of his land. It was God who pursued him, and Abraham responded. God has pursued you too. God has pursued you. God is pursuing you right now through the power of his word and his gospel. So this conversation is continuing between Abram and God. And something very important is about to happen. So we're getting these promises of God given to Abram about his generations and his his future and his familial future that he doesn't see. He's trusting in the Lord for it. But there's something around the corner that is going to seal the deal for him. Now, to set the stage for the rest of the text, most encounters with God in the scriptures are just as strange as this. They are different, intense, very unusual. If you think about it, a burning bush, a tornado of fire isn't normal. I know I don't see tornadoes of fire. Paul is blinded with scales, which sounds really gross. Don't want to see that. I've always wondered what that looks like, but don't want to see it. Moses, his face glows because of God's glory. Intense stuff. 
and this encounter that he has with the Lord doesn't disappoint. What we're about to read is a gospel preview. In verse 7, it says, I am the Lord who brought you out of from Ur, Chaldeans, to give you land to possess. O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? So essentially, Abram is asking for an assurance. He's asking for something for him to know in his heart, confidence that he can know that the Lord's going to keep his word, okay? And in verse 9, he said to him, Bring me a heifer, three years old, a female goat, three years old, a ram, three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these things, cut them in half, and laid each over, each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And, and when birds of prey came down to carcasses, on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. It's weird, okay? Yeah. What's happening? What? We were just talking about this, like, essentially Sunday school story of, you know, I'll give you generations like the stars. Okay, grab two pigeons, grab two goats. It's like, okay, what? And then I just see Abram shooing away birds from the things. You know, it literally says, like, Abram shooing away birds, okay? It just gets weird all of a sudden. And then you ask, what does this have to do with God showing Abram that he will receive the land? What is the commitment being shown right now? How does cutting animals in half have anything to do with anything? That's a really good question. To us, because we don't understand the ancient Middle Eastern rites of passage, we wouldn't get it. We wouldn't know what's going on. We don't understand it. If you notice, though, Abram knew exactly what God was going to do. That's why he was shooing away the birds. (laughs) Weird. Um, God didn't ask him to cut the animals in half. Abram already knew with the Lord that the Lord was preparing an agreement between them. More specifically, God was preparing a covenant between them. In the ancient Near East, this was a right of mutual agreement. Whenever there were two parties deciding on something fairly important, they would do just this, and it worked really well. It is making a statement and an oath all at the same time. It is saying, how do I know you're going to do what you say you're going to do? How can I have assurance in this promise? Then they would act out the consequence of the curse if they failed to operate on their promise. What they would do is they would cut the animal and set carcasses apart from each other and walk through the two pieces. This is what they would say. It's what a commentary helped helped me understand what this promise, what this covenant was saying through this rite, through this ritual, if you will. May I be cut off. May I be destroyed. May my flesh be set into two pieces to feed the birds. This is what I vow to happen to me if I don't keep my end of the deal. So essentially, you're you're bound by the consequence of what you essentially symbolized in the act. By walking through the two pieces, you you were saying, may I be as such. May I be undone. May I be without anything. May I be brought low. This is powerful stuff right here we're about to get into. Now, Abram knew exactly what was happening. God and him were about to make a deal. But Abram didn't know exactly how God was going to make the terms. And what God was about to do was going to change the world because this is the radical nature of God's love. When Abram falls asleep, God goes ahead and tells him everything that will occur before the people to go into the promised land, the story of Moses and such. It's God's way of saying, I know this is terrifying, but know for certain these things will take place. God is timeless and transcends over time. And in this moment, Abram feels the weight of God's power over everything. It's almost too much to bear for Abram. Now here's the gospel in preview. I hope you see this. It says in verse 17, when the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. Now let me unpack this. So this smoke and blaze in the original Hebrew is the same words used on Mount Sinai in the words to describe the pillar of God's presence in the Shekinah glory. So this was God's presence. God is spirit. It's 
So this is God's presence represented in this torch. God did this. So this is not the only thing that shocked Abram in this moment. This is what shocked him. God went through the pieces. How, how does Abram know he's going to keep his word? God is making a covenant here. He is making everything and putting everything, including himself, on the line. He is saying, may everything that I am be nothing. May everything that makes me great be turned to nothing. May my strength be turned to weakness. May my infinite character be finite. Let me be as these animals laying here be ripped to pieces. May my immortality suffer mortality. May the possible be impossible if I don't keep this covenant. So what does this have to do with us here? Well, I think Abram would have asked the same thing. I think Abram would have wondered what was meant by all of this because we stand and be amazed at what God had done, that God would do this. I think we all know God will come through, but not me sometimes. I, you may be asking yourself, I couldn't make it through this morning. I can't put myself on the line like this and make such a big promise that I know I will break before I leave the ceremony. We're, we're all messed up people, and so is Abram. And, and I'm going to unpack this a little bit more about how the two pieces was a covenant that God kept. But we know in the story that Abram himself wasn't ready. If you continue to read essentially Sarah wants an open marriage to suit her desire for a child now, and he goes along with it. He embraces this young, beautiful wife. Abram wasn't ready. He was a normal, messed up person, just like you and me. You can look through this text, and what you don't find is the most amazing thing. All kings making treaties like this would always require the lesser party to walk through the pieces and ratify the agreement. It was on them to keep. It was the lesser party that would actually walk through the pieces. They would never go, go alone. It was only the weaker vessel that would have to take the brunt of the agreement of things that were taken. But Abram didn't walk through. God walked through. God walked through the covenant, and Abram did nothing. Abram didn't. Essentially, God was saying, I'm going to make this covenant upon myself if you fail at any part. I'm going to take the weight of it. I'm going to take the punishment if you fail. Abram failed like two weeks later. I, I mean, it's like the, those classic mountaintop moments in our spiritual walk with God. You're like, God, I'll never fail again or whatever. And then the next day you do. But see, God still loves you. God went to the cross for you. He went through the pieces. He took the suffering. He loved you when you didn't know he loved you. That's love. God made every part of this covenant impacted on himself. And we're going to read a text in Isaiah that showed that God did keep his end of the deal because Abram and his generations after him did not follow God perfectly. They didn't hold up to their end. So someone had to be cut to pieces. Someone had to die. Because Abram, who really did nothing, messed up. In theology, we call this monergism, the truth that God is the one doing the saving in every step, not you. It's beautiful. God was saying, may I be torn to pieces even if you don't keep your end of the deal. It's all on God, both sides. God took Abram walked through the pieces for him. Abram didn't have to walk. Now, did God ever have to die? Did he ever need to be split in two? Yes, on that dreadful day, Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That day was dark. Everything changed. God knew this was all going to happen. Open your Bibles to Isaiah 53, verses 8. We're gonna, I'm going to read this. And what we're going to read is God's love. What we're about to read is God taking upon himself your sin, your mistake, your repetition of your sins and your mistakes. Isaiah 
And he did it for you while you were still a sinner. So Isaiah 53, verses 8 through 12, is God, a prophecy of God keeping his end of the deal. We know this is Christ that we're reading of. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he, has, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death, and he was numbered with transgressors, yet bore the sin of many, and makes intercession for the transgressors. Love. Three takeaways I want us to be meditating on as we wrap this up today. Three points. Abram had a messy faith too, just like you. But be encouraged. God walked through the pieces for you too when he bore the cross. The sermon is directed to you as believers in this room. You who love Jesus but struggle to trust him daily. I want us to embrace the fact that God keeps his word. So how is God's love, how is this walking through the paces enabling you to trust him? God will keep his word with you. If you believe in him, you will have eternal life. In this realm, on the side of forever, there are blessings that will overflow from trusting in God. The scriptures encourage for the saints to build one another up. This is us trusting in God. And in this, our faith is stirred and it's increased. Whenever we trust God's truth over our truth, this is when we are living out our faith. Just like reading a book I'm not much of a novel reader, like, but I've read a few. And when you read them again, you, you get that frustration with the main character. They don't know the end, and you're just like, just wait. Come on, I know you're going to mess up and not believe in the end, but I wish you knew the whole story. See, God is the author and the finisher of your faith, and he knows what's best for you, even when you're utterly confused. That's the point of faith, you see. If, if you had all the answers, where's faith? Faith is trusting God on the other side, knowing that on the other side of this struggle, on the other side of this pain you're experiencing, God knows what's best for you. He really does have your best in mind for his glory. We get promises of this in Romans, for our good and his glory. So there's goodness involved here. And by abiding in his word, we are stirring up our own faith and in that God is pleased. Our second takeaway is God's promise of, Christ's promise of eternal life for you really does matter. Really does matter. Yes, Abraham's assurance was that of an echo of the coming Messiah and God fulfilled that completely in Christ when, when Jesus died and he rose again. In that same way, we look toward the new heaven and the new earth. Not just the new heaven. We're not just going to the sweet by and by. 
We're going to get a, a new place. We're going to get a new earth, renewed, where there's no more crying, there's no more death, no more pandemics. <laughs> right. None of that. Where God is completely, where our faith is turned to sight and we see God ruling and reigning over the new earth. Sometimes I think we, we have this imaginative idea of heaven going away and leaving it all behind and some, somehow this extended great retirement. No, we're going re, re, to be involved in this great redemption story that we're going to look back in, in this timeless history where God saved humanity out of love and we're going to rejoice forever together just like this. Real people, not just floating ghost spirits or something like up there. We have these ideas that aren't biblical. New heaven, new earth, together, all the loved ones we've lost that are in Christ, we're going to be reunited again. So it's very real that eternal hope, in a sense, is already ours. And that's the confidence that we must celebrate every time we gather like this, that death and the final death was truly defeated. My third takeaway is have faith in God of the unknown future because he loves you. I've counseled many of you in this room over these last couple years, and I know the battles and struggles you're facing every day. I know it's tough making ends meet. I know it's hard when a loved one passes away. I know it's hard when there's unfaithfulness in your marriage. Fear and anxiety have really begun to grip our county, our families, our workplaces, our marriages, and our children like I've never seen before. I get it. I'm a parent. I'm a husband. I'm a dad. I'm an employer. But we're all in this together. We're in the thick of it. We're in the trenches right alongside one another. But do not give fear more power to live in your mind. It's always hungry. It's insatiable. It will always ask for more anxiety. It will always ask for more worry. It will ask for more nights where you can't go to sleep. Do not give it power. Fight fear with confidence in the maker of heaven and earth. Let me encourage you to have faith in Jesus. He knows and loves you. Abraham was weak just like you and me. He was not strong against every temptation every time, but he did have faith. Just as I shared my story of faithfulness from my friends, it is a bro brotherly love that I know and maybe knew I was cared for, and it does something to us. And just like I said a million times over, God's love for you is shown when he delivered you from sin and made you a son and daughter into his family. There is nothing on this earth that can take that away. There's this hymn that I love. It's the, it's the last verse of the hymn. Come, you sinner, poor and needy. And it says, view him prostrate in the garden, on the ground your maker lies. On the bloody tree behold him, sinner, will this not suffice? And that's so true and beautiful. If the God who would send his son to die a brutal death for you will not convince you of love, nothing will. Jesus loves you. That does something to us. Holiness, as Pastor Tim has been preaching about, is no longer a duty but a delight. That is the delight that compels us to trust, have faith, and live holy lives because we love him back. So have faith in him for your future, for your good and his glory. Let's pray. Dear God, we just thank you for your mercy, your grace. Your heart that we would trust in you. God, help us to trust in you. God, help us to live our lives that are compelled by delight and beauty, wholeness, and love. How, what good news you give us. For our good and for your glory, God, you've called us to abide in you. As we prepare for communion this morning, 
Um, I may need one more server since Pastor Tim is out. But um, as we prepare for communion this morning, we're going to be able to partake as a faith family a remembrance of Christ being torn in two. And we're going to be able to experience this love that God has poured out freely yet costly on your behalf. So as we partake, as, as we take just a moment to draw near to the Lord and to confess our sin before him, the scriptures say that he's faithful and just to forgive us of all in unrighteousness. I would encourage you to talk to God. That faith is the connecting bridge between you and you, your creator. And so we are going to take a moment um, of silence here in a moment. And I would encourage you to, to talk to him just as Abraham did. That same faith God has given you to talk to your creator. So we're, we're, we're going to take some time here and do just that. If, if you have not uh, confessed the Lord as your Savior, we just ask that you um, gracious, graciously abstain from receiving the Lord's table this morning. We won't look at you weird or anything, but this is exclusive for the body of Christ. Yet, you don't have to be a member of this church. If, if you are a believer, trust in the Lord Jesus, you are more than welcome to take uh, the Lord's communion with us today. So let's, let's take a moment of silence and let, let's talk to God as Abraham would through faith in Christ.